It's a real blessing to be at, let alone speak at this famous conference of which I have heard so much for 10 years. To be here, let alone to speak here, is quite exciting for me and for my husband. And it's wonderful to see not only uh, some people that I've just met, but some dear old friends here tonight. And even better to get an introduction or a lead in rather from Romans 4, the justification of the ungodly. That says pretty much everything. Now, I was late getting here because my computer and its connection at the hotel where I'm staying in Midtown failed, and I couldn't mail in, email in my manuscript. So I'm using a somewhat marked up, pasted together manuscript. I think it'll be all right, but if there is a blip here or there, that's the reason. The raising of the crucified one. How's the sound? Is the sound? Oh, good. All right. When the day of Pentecost had come, Peter lifted up his voice and addressed the people, saying, This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. In recent decades, I have tried out an idea, fully expecting someone to contradict it, but no one ever has. I believe that if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, we would never have heard of him. In all these years, I have not heard an argument to the contrary. The Romans crucified tens of thousands of people before the time of Christ. But as far as I know, we do not know the name of a single one of these tens of thousands. This was exactly what the Romans had in mind. Crucifixion was a particularly cruel, sadistic, and dehumanizing method of putting someone to death. And it was as public as the Romans could make it, along a main road where passersby could revile the horribly suffering victim. The message was clear. This object pinned up before you is not one of you, not fit to die like a human being, not part of the human community, no more than a beast or an insect, fit only to be discarded like trash and obliterated from human memory. We might think of this when we read or hear about the nameless corpses that we find in the southwestern deserts, dead from thirst and known to no one. The crucified person became a non-existent nothing. So when Peter in the book of Acts says, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He is making a claim so extravagant as to be unique in all the history 
of the world. That's the essential theme of this 625-page book that I have managed to write by the grace of God. The very idea of worshiping a man who was put to death in the most dehumanizing way possible is so utterly preposterous on the face of it as to convince it of the truth of our faith. To convince us, that is, who have had our eyes opened by the Spirit of God. Why it is that not everyone is convinced is a great mystery before which I can only remain silent. I have been speaking and writing about the crucifixion for more than 20 years, for most of my life, in fact. Indeed, this past Lenten season, I've been on my feet for six weeks straight talking about the crucifixion. I am therefore truly overjoyed that this Mockingbird Conference is occurring during the Easter season, the great 50 days. And so I have a new opportunity. I've been saying for some years that our idea about the crucifixion is too small. Now I'm adding to that. Our idea of the resurrection has been too small also. Now I'm about to say something that does not apply to a single person in this space. And I'm very glad of that because if it did apply to you, I would lose you. Here's what I want to say. For 79 years now, I have been in a pew somewhere on the day of resurrection. I'm almost never in the pulpit myself on that day. Out of these 79 sermons, some of them have been, in fact, almost all of them, have been among the most disappointing sermons I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> to say that they were utterly inadequate to the day of all days would be an understatement. However, to show you that I'm not quite as stuck on myself as I may be reputed to be, I'm not very happy about my own Easter sermons either, preached on Easter Eve or Easter Monday or Easter Tuesday. I've come to believe that just as the event of the resurrection itself transcends all categories, so also it transcends all human language. Many faithful interpreters have observed that the discrepancies in the Easter narratives in the four Gospels point to this difficulty in speaking about something something that happened within history, and yet something that belongs to the transhistorical dimension. So preaching the resurrection presents unique problems. Now coming at this from a slightly different angle, in teaching preachers in recent years, I've drawn a distinction between a Jesus kerygma and a Christ kerygma. Most of you know this Greek word. In ordinary Hellenistic Greek, it means simply proclamation or announcement. But very quickly, in the apostolic era, kerygma came to mean the proclamation or announcement of the gospel. So if it's the kerygma, it's the gospel. And if it's not, it's not. Now, this immediately raises the question, what is the gospel anyway? Pretty much every speaker has raised this question. What is the gospel and what are its counterfeits? Now, many people in the mainline churches today would say, if it's about Jesus, it's the gospel. Well, 
yes and no. It all depends on who he is and what dimension he belongs to. I believe, and this is controversial to be sure, but I believe that the changes in the Episcopal prayer book and the lectionary 40 years ago, combined with certain theological and cultural factors, has led us away from the gospel. We do not hear the Christ kerygma, which created the church in the first place. We hear a Jesus kerygma. Now let me explain, just to be sure, I'm not talking about the clergy of this church. And I'm probably not talking about many of you here either, but I am trying to diagnose a problem. The sermon in the revised English, excuse me, the revised Episcopal liturgy occurs immediately after the solemn reading of the gospel, usually with a very elaborate and majestic procession, followed immediately by the sermon, which is almost always from one of the synoptic gospels, rarely from John, and almost never from the Old Testament or the epistles. This has led to an emphasis on what Jesus did and said, or is supposed to have done and said, detached from the high Christology, yes, the high Christology of the evangelists and the apostles and the great church councils. So you get Jesus in this Jesus kerygma, but you don't get the Lord Jesus Christ. We hear a great deal about Jesus' table fellowship and his embrace of outcasts. And this is very true and very important. But we don't hear the climactic confession of Thomas, the doubting disciple, who, when he met the risen Jesus, exclaimed, my Lord and my God. The evangelist John has built his gospel to come into a climax with that supreme confession. In the terms I'm putting forward, it's fair to say that the Christ kerygma includes, fully includes the Jesus kerygma and acknowledges its significance. However, the Jesus kerygma does not include the Christ kerygma. I'd like to show you just a tiny bit of what that means by taking us through the beautiful story in the Gospel of John, um, excuse me, the Gospel of Luke, about the encounter of Jesus with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I was touched by the action of the Holy Spirit that the opening prayer of this conference on Friday night, read to us by Paul Zoll from the Order for Evening, is based entirely on the recognition scene in Emmaus. There's a painting that I love in the Doria Pamphili Gallery in Rome. Perhaps a few of you might have seen it. It is by two lesser known artists of the Renaissance. It's called Landscape with the Journey to Emmaus. It's 98% landscape and 2% journey. Two disciples are seen with a third man on a barely visible path. All around them and into the far distance is a panoramic view which the artist obviously enjoyed painting. There are 101 pictures of the walk to Emmaus online, but I couldn't find this one. Nevertheless, it made an unforgettable impression on me. What struck me, what I remember, was the miniature size 
of the three tiny human figures almost entirely lost in the middle of the enormous landscape. Here is the resurrected but still disguised Lord Jesus, leading the most consequential Bible study in the history of the world. And the world takes no notice whatsoever. Here's what Luke tells us. Two disciples of Jesus one named Cleopas and one not named, had left Jerusalem on foot in the direction of Emmaus, a village some seven miles away. Only three days before, these disciples watched their beloved master suffer an unspeakable public death by torture. They are obviously trying to come to terms with their feelings as we might go for a long walk to try to recover from a profound and life-threatening shock. While they were talking and discussing together, Luke writes, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Notice that passive construction. Their eyes were kept. There's an external agency at work here. Their incomprehension, it seems, has a purpose, and that purpose is held in reserve by some power other than themselves. And so Jesus said to them, what is this conversation you're having as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened? And he said, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Now this account of Jesus given by his own disciples is the, is the Jesus kerygma. These two disciples function in the story as representatives of the whole body of disciples. These two did not know who Jesus was, so they do not know who he is either. Their understanding of the man they followed, the man who was crucified, is not wrong but it's woefully inadequate. He was a prophet, yes. He was mighty in word and deed, yes. We hoped that he had been the redeemer of Israel, but he ended up crucified. Now they've heard an astonishing story that some women of our company went to the tomb early that same day and saw it empty but him they did not see. The disciples simply do not know what to make of this. They do not understand who the man they had followed really was. They had hoped, but hope is all they had, and now it had been irreparably destroyed. Such is the effect of a crucifixion. A crucified man is not only not a redeemer, a crucified man is a non-person, a nothing. It would seem that these disciples had never heard a Christ kerygma. For them, the man they revered has become a thing of the irre irrecoverable past. 
insofar as they are able to recall his sayings and doings, he has become the historical Jesus. And the more that the days and weeks and months go by, the more he retreats into the undependable memories of those few who were close to him. And Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, interpret, he interpreted to them all the scriptures concerning himself. I'm looking for my glass of water. <clears throat> he interpreted <clears throat> to them all the scriptures concerning himself. There was a time, <laughs> oh, they thought I was preaching from over there. Yes, sir. I like to hold on to a lectern. <laughs> Jesus interpreted, essentially, the Old Testament and all its references to himself. Now, as a lot of you know, there was a time when this sort of Christocentric interpretation of the Old Testament was considered medieval or naive or anti-Judaic or fundamentalist or some pernicious combination thereof. I'm going to take some advantage of my age here and tell you that I was trained in biblical studies at a time when the historical critical or scientific method of studying the Bible still dominated the scene. However, its reign in 1972 was coming to an end. When I arrived at seminary, we were still learning about the documentary hypothesis. When I graduated three years later, there was already a massive shift going on, a shift to pre-modern interpretation and what it had to teach us today. Paul Ricoeur has called this the second naivete, a very useful concept. Most of you here have long since escaped from the tyranny of J, E, P, D, Q, and proto-Luke, thanks be to God. Some of you may not even know what that is. And yet, and yet, there are today many, and you know their names, who have devoted their lives to telling us that Jesus is essentially a historical figure with whom we can come to terms. The fact that these terms are typically our own culturally conditioned terms does not seem to register. The rest of us, it is implied, if not stated outright by these worthies, are those left behind primitives who, looking sad, said, we had hoped. My friend, Will Willimon, likes to say that the whole Jesus Seminar project and its many satellites have one thing as their fundamental premise. Their fundamental premise, Jesus is dead. Therefore, the church is left as a memorial society made up of the ones who had hoped. I remember a blurb for a book 
called The Gospel of, a, of the Beloved Disciple. This was in the 1980s. It was written by James Carr, so religion professor down the street at NYU. This book, in approximately 1985, was advertised with a blurb by the director of the, the, the then director of the Jesus Seminar. He wrote, Dr. Kars has created a new gospel that breathes fresh life into the Jesus tradition. It may even bring the sage of Nazareth back to life. <laughs> you want to try that again? <laughs> you see, the Jesus charisma, this is a little unkind. I'm overstating, but this is a friendly group. The Jesus charisma is based on a dead Jesus. We can tell stories about what he did and what he said. He was mighty in deed and word, indeed. We can talk about his effect on us. We had hoped. But if this is detached from the essential inner truth of the biblical witness, it's all dependent on nothing more than human feeling, human insight. Trouble is, human feeling and human insight are notoriously undependable. And besides, more often than not, our human eyes are kept from seeing. We are locked into a worldview that simply has no place for a trans-historical, transcendent gospel. But when the Jesus charisma becomes the Christ charisma, well, let's return to our story. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Is this a new theory of interpretation taught by a dead rabbi? Is this an outdated relic of how the Old Testament used to be understood by an ignorant pre-scientific population, unenlightened by improved contemporary knowledge? It all depends. It all depends on whether you think Jesus is a prisoner of history or not. We had hoped, but they crucified him. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him saying, abide with us for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Jesus Christ no longer belongs to the past. He is the Lord of the past and of the present and above all of the future. He is not a prisoner of what we make of his history. It is not possible to talk about the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. They are one and the same. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first 
and the last, who is and who was and who is to come. And so they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, who said, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened to them on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now all this news of the resurrection, this explosive Christ kerygma happened among a minuscule number of people in extremely obscure circumstances. It's important for us in this filled up room to remember these minuscule beginnings when we get discouraged. It all began in tiny groups of obscure people, Peter and John racing to the tomb, the women with their spices, the fearful 11 locked into a room. But the hidden event of the resurrection is indissolubly linked to a public historical event. The crucifixion happened in the sight of the whole Roman world, so to speak. It was as public as it was possible for an execution to be. As Paul said to Agrippa, this was not done in a corner. In the sight of Jews and Gentiles alike, the itinerant teacher from the Galilee was deliberately squashed into nothing by the edict of the great powers and apparently erased from the human record. And therefore, St. Paul was soon to write, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, mere nothings, in order to bring to nothing the things that are. What is a nothing if not a crucified man? And who is it who brings creation into being ex nihilo, out of nothing. As the original creation emerged by the word of God out of nothing, the Christ kerygma emerged out of nothing. Paul again to the Corinthians, from now on therefore, We regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once regarded Christ from a human point of view, the Jesus kerygma, we regard him thus no longer. If anyone is in Christ, new creation, the old has passed away, Behold, the new has come. Let me ask you something. Does the greeting, Happy Easter, work for you? (laughs) Does that convey the message that created the movement that spread out from a bedraggled little group of utterly defeated disciples to set the whole Mediterranean world afire within a few decades? What is the kerygma that galvanized the apostles, that changed the message from he did mighty works and he was a prophet and he was the sage of Nazareth into 
my Lord and my God. And so they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They got up from the dinner table and walked eight miles through the night to deliver their message. Do you think they said, Happy Easter? <laughs> now, this is an old story, but I haven't told it in a while. A few of you may have heard it before. This seems like the right time and the right place to tell it again. My first Easter day in New York City was my first year at Grace Church. This was 1982. The New York Times habitually refers today, these now, habitually refers to New York in the 1980s as gritty, the gritty New York of 1980. It was indeed that Easter Sunday. It certainly was gritty on local Lower Park Avenue and Lower Broadway as I drove in from the suburbs. It was a cloudy, gloomy day. Everything was closed. There were almost no people to be seen anywhere. Ugly, dark metal gates were pulled down over the store windows. I passed Calvary Church I'm sorry to say the door was shut. There was no sign of life. I'm a Virginian. I'm used to the glory of a blooming spring. I was profoundly depressed by the lifeless streets and the dark overcast day. I was wondering if I would be able to overcome these feelings. When I arrived at 12th Street, I noticed that there was parking available just ahead on the west side of the street, opposite Grace Church. So I pulled into a spot. I looked across at the church. The door was wide open. Standing on the top step was an usher, David Crum, who 40 years later is a, a, a still an usher at a church upstate. David was standing there. In honor of Easter Day, he had on a very spiffy suit and a bright white carnation. I hollowed across Broadway, David, the Lord is risen. And I promise you that without a moment's hesitation, David shouted back, the Lord is risen indeed. Two disciples sharing the great news in the gritty streets of New York. And at that moment, as I sprinted across the street, I knew that Easter had truly come. Now I admit that sometimes I feel that I have grown weary in the service of the Lord. But like those disciples who ran all the way from Emmaus to Jerusalem to tell their news, there is no time for rest till glows the western sky and the long shadows o'er our pathway lie. I hope to continue saying, the Lord is risen until my pitcher is broken at the fountain. The church is not a memorial society. It is the body of the living Lord and Christ. I close with this antiphon from the liturgy of the great 50 days. You will recognize how it is taken from our story. Abide with us, alleluia, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. Alleluia. And also you'll notice how the hymn, Abide With Me, is also based directly on Luke's narrative. As my husband and I become aware that our own deaths may not be all that far away, this hymn and these words mean more and more to us. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, 
Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, in life, in death, O oh Lord, abide with me. Dear people of God, Alleluia. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs>